Good evening to our UCD alumni and friends tuning in this evening. I'm delighted to extend a very warm welcome to this special online celebration of the UCD Alumni Awards 2020. Our 300,000 global alumni network in 184 countries is richly diverse and impressively far-reaching and is one of our greatest assets. It's fitting that we should honour the wonderful achievements of some of our most successful graduates annually. An outstanding UCD education has been the launch pad for leaders, influencers and innovators all over the world who are using their talents, intellect and creativity to change our global society for the better. The annual UCD Alumni Awards dinner in O'Reilly Hall is normally one of the highlights of the university alumni calendar. This year, unfortunately, the extraordinary circumstances of the global pandemic dictate that we move our celebration to an online format. Notwithstanding the difficulties of the past eight months, our graduates and university community have rallied in the face of adversity. And I know that you are all with me in spirit as I warmly congratulate the 2020 UCD Alumni Awardees. This year, the award for Arts and Humanities goes to Dalton Phillips. The award for Business goes to Mark Pollock. And for Engineering and Architecture, it goes to Roisin Hennigan. Our awardee for Health and Agricultural Sciences is Professor Delia Grace Randolph. And for Law, Sally Hayden takes the award. For research, innovation and impact, the award goes to Dr. Sandra Collins. And for science, Dr. Cormac Kilty is our awardee. Finally, the award for social sciences goes to Sharon Donnery. And for sport, Dr. Jack McCaffrey takes the award. Each of these individuals embodies UCD's pursuit of excellence and is an inspiration to us all. They are incredible role models for the present and future generations of UCD students who will seek to follow in their illustrious footsteps and make their own mark on the world. This year's celebration takes the format of four webinar conversations, each reflecting one of the pillars of UCD's Rising to the Future strategy. Our award winners will be grouped across these four events for engaging discussions on the themes of business, health, resilience and innovation. I'd also like to thank our strategic partners, our academic leaders and friends for their support on this special occasion. I extend my congratulations once again to our Alumni Award 2020 winners and I look forward to welcoming you to campus in the future to celebrate in person. Thank you, President. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the UCD Alumni Awards in Focus conversation series. Unfortunately, given the situation with the pandemic, the UCD Alumni Awards Gala Dinner cannot take place as an in-person event this year. However, we're delighted to have in its place a virtual webinar series that will celebrate nine of UCD's outstanding alumni awardees throughout the month of November. We're delighted to welcome our UCD alumni community from all around the world to hear from nine of UCD's most notable alumni and showcase the breadth and depth of UCD's leading programs. The four UCD alumni awardees in Focus Conversations will reflect the four strategic themes of UCD's strategy entitled Rising to the Future. And these four are creating a sustainable global society, building a healthy world, Thirdly, empowering humanity. And lastly, transforming through digital technology. UCD research shows that the ability to navigate, overcome and recover from adversity is the key ingredient for happiness, for success and satisfaction in life. At the heart of this is resilience, the ability to recover quickly from setbacks and difficulties or even grow in the face of adversity. Our second UCD Alumni Awardees in Focus Conversation will look at resilience and feature three awardees who are no strangers to coping with adversity. Mark Pollock, Dr. Jack McCaffrey and Sally Hayden. The conversation this evening is very kindly supported by Intel, whose purpose is to create world-changing technology that enriches the lives of every person on the planet. 
Intel have been proudly manufacturing advanced technology in Ireland for 30 years. Without further ado, allow me to introduce you to tonight's UCD alumni awardees. As footballers, they don't come much better than Dr. Jack McCaffrey. Jack has been a key part of the all-conquering Dublin Gaelic football side. He's achieved so much, five All-Irelands, four All-Stars, and a Footballer of the Year gong. He played Gaelic football with UCD. He captained the Sigerson Cup winning team of 2016. One of Gaelic football's greatest ever wingbacks, Jack is currently playing with his club Clontarf and also working hard as a paediatric doctor. Sally Hayden is an award-winning journalist and photographer currently focused on migration, conflict and humanitarian crisis. She won the Simon Cumbers Student Media Award for Print Journalism in 2013, funding a trip to Malawi to report on women's rights. She's since reported from across Africa, Europe and the Middle East, working with the Financial Times, the BBC, the New York Times, the Washington Post and many other media outlets. And then athlete, explorer and motivational speaker Mark Pollock's track record of overcoming adversity has inspired people all over the world. Mark became an adventure athlete in 1998 and was the first blind person to race to the South Pole. He also won silver and bronze medals for rowing at the Commonwealth Games. But in 2010, a fall from a second story window left him paralyzed. And now Mark is exploring the frontiers of spinal cord injury and is on a mission to fast track a cure for paralysis. Before we start the conversation, you will hear from Director of Sport, Brian Mullins, Dean of Law, Professor Imelda Marr, and College Principal and Dean of Business, Professor Anthony Brabazon, about their awardees. The UCD Alumni Awardee in Law in 2020 is Sally Hayden. Sally graduated in 2012 and is now an investigative freelance journalist who mainly works on migration and humanitarian conflict. Uh, literally around the world. She translates, if you like, the experience of the individual migrant in a way that allows us to engage more fully and to respond more humanely to the experiences of these people who we get lost in numbers. The breadth and range of her work is one of the things that really stands out. So what we find is an extraordinary volume of work coming from her and a volume of work that has been published or republished across every continent. So her reach is absolutely extraordinary. One of the wonderful things about having um, Sally as the awardee this year is that she's only eight years out of college. Um, and to have achieved so much in such a small space of time and to be able to have such an impact in such a small period, relatively short period of time when you look across a full career is particularly inspiring for our students um, to have a younger role model is wonderful and very significant and shows that impact starts at, at a, a young age. The recipient of the 2020 Alumni Award in Sport is Dr. Jack McCaffrey. And Dr. Jack graduated in 2019 from the School of Medicine at UCD. Well, Jack epitomized uh, everything that being a sports star involves. His sense of dedication, sense of commitment, his striving to lead and give by best example were hallmarks of his time at UCD. And during that time, not only did he excel on behalf of the university uh, as a student, and as a sportsman, he also uh, excelled for his uh, county of Dublin and uh, made a significant contribution to the landmark achievement of being the first county that achieved five successive All-Ireland victories consecutively. His own individual achievements have been recognised by uh, the award of All-Stars in a number of years, 2015-2013, Player of the Year in 2013 and Young Player of the Year the year before that. In 2016, he had the honour of leading a UCD to their first Sigerson Championship victory in over 20 years. So Jack not only has excelled as part of the team, but he has also uh, excelled as an individual and been recognised for that. I'm 
delighted to announce that Mark Pollock is the recipient of the 2020 UCD Alumni Award in Business. Mark graduated from UCD with a Master of Business Studies degree in 2003. His story, achievements and impact are truly inspirational. Despite turning blind, he continued competitive rowing, winning silver and bronze medals for Northern Ireland in 2002 Commonwealth Games. He also took up marathon running, completing the North Pole Marathon. In 2009, he overcame some of the toughest terrain on the planet and became the first blind man to reach the South Pole. Following a fall that was left him paralysed, Mark started on a new journey, this time to cure paralysis in our lifetime by exploring the intersection where humans and technology collide. Over the last decade, Mark has played a direct role in enabling research and development projects in this area with a value of more than 10 million euro. As a global motivational speaker, Mark has inspired millions of people, given hope to those facing adversity and helped many to resolve the tension between acceptance and hope. He has demonstrated incredible accomplishment, resilience and impact, and is an outstanding role model for our students. Congratulations, Mark. Welcome, Mark Pollock, Jack McCaffrey and Sally Hayden. Uh, the two boys are local, but uh, Sally is somewhat further away in Ethiopia, and there may be a slight delay on the line. Uh, Sally, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I want, Sally, to bring you back to your time in UCD and what it was about this place that informed your choice of career later on. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I'm not really like a long-term planner. I'm not somebody who always knew that I wanted to be a journalist. And when I was thinking about going to university and what I do, I figured that I wanted to know more about how the world works. And law was a really good choice for that because it's very hard to understand a society without understanding their laws. Um, and I actually grew up down the road from UCD. I learned to ride my bike in UCD. Like I learned to drive in UCD. I've always, UCD has always been part of my life, but yeah, studying law really, you know, I learned a lot, like a lot more than just the classes. And I also enjoyed, they, they have an elective system. I'm not sure if they still do, but at the time um, you could do one elective in something else. And I did one elective in uh, different things like Middle Eastern politics, um, something to do with, uh, I can't remember, but like a society course, like a load of different things. And that also gave me an opportunity to try out different, different aspects of, you know, again, learning about the world. Now, uh, Jack, uh, you obviously studied medicine. You're practicing now as a, a pediatric physician. Uh, which was your first love, though, when you were in college? Playing football or studying medicine? Um, hi, Pat. Well, I suppose my football career had well and truly kicked off by the time I darkened the door in Belfield. Um, so that was in in kind of in full flow and i was very fortunate that i had a lot of friends starting in college already through various football teams that i'd been involved with and um, the medicine was a bit more of a slow burner but thankfully it's uh, it's still going strong and it was a it was a really phenomenal place the, the way ucd works from a medical point of view is it, it kind of starts quite broad and with um kind of basic sciences and then it builds over the course of six years towards your more kind of clinically relevant stuff so it uh it started slowly but definitely got there in the end it's always portrayed as a very tough course because you've got to get 600 plus points to get in in the first place but you can't be playing football and practicing medicine or studying medicine <laughs> at a high level i mean <laughs> how does you manage well i suppose there's a couple of things that kind of fed into that firstly um i've i've said it a couple of times that that football and and study or work kind of go hand in hand. They just they force you to kind of be quite organised and um, and be on top of your time management. And um, the times I've struggled is when I've had say a busy period in work and nothing else going on, and then I find that I just flit a, a lot. And um, secondly, when I was coming into college, there was a kind of move away from having to get that perfect leaving cert to get into medicine. The, the HBAT came in, and you still have to do a good leaving cert, but not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and then finally, th there's a real kind of ethos in UCD and in medicine in general of, of kind of having a holistic approach to everything these days. You'll find there's a lot fewer people who are just purely academic 
or purely anything it's, it's kind of people have realized that you draw on your different life experiences to make yourself a, a better doctor so I was always really encouraged to keep up the football from the medical point of view mm. and then on the flip side any football team I've been involved in with, with sorry have been very accommodating and if you ever had to prioritize your career or anything like that that was that was encouraged in fact not only tolerated. Uh, do you think you ever got a break from some of your Dublin-born tutors who might have appreciated what you were doing in Crow Park with the Dubs? Um, <laughs> well, how do I answer this correctly? Um, the, the sport-interested Dublin-based doctors tend to lean towards the rugby, I think, more than the, uh, the Gaelic football side of things. So I, I probably got more flack from our our country colleagues than, than benefits from the Dublin guys. But uh, I know it's great. And, you know, it would be remiss of me not to mention certain people I would have come across, like Jerry McEntee, when you're on placement in the matter, who's a legend in, in Gaelic football circles and then a legend for entirely different reasons in, in medical circles. Um, and then we would have had our Dublin team doctors who were usually based in Dublin hospitals as well. Look, it, it was great to kind of have these contacts and to have friendly faces around the place, but ultimately it's the kind of profession where nobody's going to cut corners and just pass you along because you can kick a ball. Um, there's kind of, there are more pressing concerns. Yeah. Well, now, Mark, uh, you've seen more than your fair share of doctors in uh, your life thus far. <laughs> but let's go back to UCD. What was your experience in UCD like? I, I was rehabilitating uh, after going, going blind. And in 1998, when I, well, I could walk and I could see at that time back in, in 98, I was just about to graduate from my undergrad. Uh, from the university down the road, um, uh, down in Trinity. I was about to graduate. I was going to go off and start a job in investment banking. And I was rowing for the, for the university and also, for in, also internationally. So when I went blind, I didn't just lose my sight. I lost my identity. Uh, I felt kind of excluded from social life. Didn't think I was going to get a job at all. And, um, and certainly I wasn't part of, of, of university life. So after I went blind, I, getting a job was important so that I could earn some money and be independent. I, I got that in place back here in, in Dublin. I, I then went back rowing. Uh, I went down and to the Commonwealth Games. And my master's in business studies in Smurfit Business School was, I did that part time. And it was actually the first time that I really found myself feeling comfortable uh, in an academic setting. And I think part of it was because by the time you get to do your master's, uh, there's much more discussion to be had, much more debate, um, much less go and learn that and, uh, and write down the answers in the exams. There was, there was room for a creativity and uh, an exploration of, of your curiosity. So it was part of, I suppose, being in UCD and particularly in the business school was part of rebuilding, rebuilding my identity. Now, I remember talking to you in that interim phase when uh, you had gone blind, you were uh, legally blind, but yet your resilience and your courage uh, were demonstrated every day in, in ordinary life. And then you have another accident to compound your misfortune. It would have done for most people, I think. Instead, you emerge, I can't say stronger than ever, but as strong, as resilient as before. Where does all that come from? Um, well, I think, I think I, I don't know whether I'm getting to practice it uh, throughout my life, but I, I, think, I think you learn in, in sport, as, as Jack will know, and perhaps from the, the situations that, that Sally covers, that in life, there's, there's so many things, so many external things that you, you can't control, but your choices with regard to them, as uh, the great Stoic Epictetus said, uh, externals I cannot control, but my choices with regard to them I do control. Where will I find good and bad in me, in my choices? And that, that framing is, is really what I've been practicing in sport as a, as a young guy in the aftermath of blindness and now in the aftermath of paralysis. So I, I know I can really only be in charge of what happens next, not what has gone. So I detest 
disabilities. Um, that's not to say there isn't uh, there are lots of opportunities ahead. Now, Jack, you also took time out of normal life to go to the third world. Uh, what prompted that? Um, yeah, so in, in 2016, I just took a, a summer off between college years to do a bit of traveling and uh, do a medical elective down in Zambia. Um, I suppose it was multifactorial. There were probably two different things that happened. One, I decided not to play football that year. And I think I would have done that regardless of what I was doing, whether I was staying in Ireland or whatever it was going to be. And then secondly, there was the choice to go down to Africa. Um, and that uh, had a couple of factors in it as well. One, I kind of fell in with goal and went down to Ethiopia with them. And that was a, a phenomenal opportunity to go and see firsthand the kind of work that's going on in refugee camps like Gambella and food programs when there's droughts and famines. That that was something that was never going to happen again. So I, I really was was keen to do that. And then secondly, um, I had a contact in a hospital in Zambia where I could do a medical elective. And, and that was fantastic. It uh Unfortunately, it was at a point in my training where I couldn't really do much clinically. I hadn't, I hadn't finished in college. I hadn't done most of my clinical placement. But what it definitely did was kind of opened your eyes to how a lot of other people are living and certainly gave me a bit of an impetus to want to go back there at some point in the future when hopefully I can be a bit, a bit more useful um, than I was at that point. Um, what are your reflections having seen the way the medical services work in these countries, which don't have huge budgets for their equivalents of the HSE, if indeed they even have a HSE, and then you come home and we're all moaning and we're all whinging and we're all giving out? You know, it must change you. Um, I suppose, I, I think it does, yeah, definitely. Um, you have to be a little bit careful. You probably, everyone goes through that two-week phase where they come back and they're, holier than thou and I'm not buying any new clothes and all my friends who give out I just like I was hitting them with various quotes anyway um, I got out of that phase very quickly and um, it, it certainly is eye-opening and it, it makes you appreciate the things that we have at the same time you know I, I do think that we should constantly be working to improve ourselves on a personal level and the kind of systems we work in and um, I think if we get a, a, as good a society as we can here or as good a health system as we can here, then we can be a far more used to, to people abroad as well. Um, but it, it certainly, and you know, even we've actually done well to get this far without mentioning COVID, but in, in this time, it, it, it kind of brings the whole world together and you realize that we're only really as strong as our, as our weakest link, if you could put it like that. And uh, Ireland, we're, we're certainly in, in that group of countries that are very, very fortunate and, we need to be aware of that and, and be helping out others, which I think, in fairness, we have a strong tradition of doing and, and we do quite well. Now, I'll go to Sally and hopefully the communication with Ethiopia will be uh, improved. Sally, that question about the precarious nature of your work, you're not in control of events, you're seeing all sorts of privations and difficulties, sometimes wars. Um, what's it like living that life? Um. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't really, I've been a journalist now for seven years. I haven't had that much time to stop and reflect on it, to be honest. Like I do work from story to story and I am freelance. So I spend a lot of time just convincing people that things are important. Um, but I do think that like my, you know, my life isn't necessarily hard, but yeah, the harder thing is trying to make sure that stories get published, trying to, you know, make sure that people are interested, like budgets are being cut in journalism. I'm freelance, so, you know, I have to pitch every story. And um, yeah, that can just, that can, you know, that, that's more difficult to be honest than, than most of what I personally experience day to day. But of course I see and interview a lot of people who have been through a lot of terrible things. And, you know, the story isn't really about me at the end of the day, so. No. Every country in the world has experienced uh, the, the coronavirus and people afflicted with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. What's it like where you are at the moment? I mean, are you conscious of the global pandemic? Yeah, so I actually spent seven months in Uganda um, and I just left there the start of this month. And in Uganda, the case numbers were very small, but now they're escalating. And then I've come to Ethiopia where they 10 times more cases and I'm going to go to Europe on Sunday which 
is in terms of coronavirus much more terrifying than anything that's happening here um or you know coronavirus wise and yeah it's 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 strange here because like it is a big deal in one sense but also people are trying to survive on a day-to-day -day basis and so they can't really stop and you know do social distancing stay in their homes like they don't have the money to survive not going out people don't um a lot of people don't have jobs that have involved being on a computer you know so it's it's very different it's very much like every day everybody's doing not even an analysis but just trying to ignore coronavirus i'd say but but people in ethiopia they're wearing masks <laughs> like i've heard that in europe there's been problems with getting people to wear masks and here they're very widespread so yeah there's i don't know differences yeah, living in the, the kind of world you're living in, reporting on the trouble spots of the world, um, how long do you think you can do something like that? I mean, is there a yearning to come back here and maybe do something a little more settled, perhaps? Uh, no, I mean, I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing, but I am, I'm writing a book now which involves... Um, you know, having to think a bit more or like think a bit more long term rather than just doing day to day news stories. But I mean, I want to keep doing this for as long as I can. But obviously, like the journalism industry is in crisis. And so as a profession, like I'm not I'm not in it to make money. You know what I mean? I'm not. If I had stayed in law, I would have be a lot richer now. But that's like I think that journalism has to be a passion. It has to be something that you really care about or you wouldn't last in this profession as you also know, pass. Now, Mark, um, in your case, it, it's almost like um, when something happens to you, you say, show me the challenge. You, you go blind. I want to row, and I'm going to row in the Commonwealth Games. I'm going to keep doing the things that sighted people do. Then you are paralyzed, and you say, well, I'm going to walk. So you are concentrating on the development of the exoskeleton, which is kind of a superstructure you can put around someone who's paralyzed and they get to walk. And I know that you practice in such a device and you help uh, support the funding of such d devices. I mean, it's, you're like someone who says, you know, where's the next mountain? Mm. Well, I, I, I do seem to be somewhat of an expert in uh, acquiring challenges that I uh, don't actually want. So uh, if that qualifies me as a, an expert, then, uh, then yeah, yes, I am. But I think, you know, when I, when I look over the, the various things that I've, that I've been doing where I've actually had an impact, they're almost like a, a, the classic skills of the, uh, the heroic age of, of, of exploration, you know, the Shackleton, Scots and Amundsen's, just picked a target, regardless of what was going, they picked the target, they put a team together, they raised the money, they told the story, that helped to raise more money, and so they went again on another expedition. And I sort of modeled that a little bit um, in the 10th anniversary after I went blind by racing to the South Pole uh, over 43 days. And then after my accident, uh, once I digested the challenge and the reality of what it was going to mean to be paralyzed, I started to look forward and I started to be interested in the attempts to find a cure. So that's aggressive physical therapy, walking in robotic legs, electrical stimulation of the spinal cord with exercise physiologists being part of uh, the scientific team. And, and I suppose I just feel like I'm on a new expedition, setting a target to cure paralysis in our lifetime, bringing people together to do that, raising the money, telling the story and going again. I sort of have, I have one set of skills, the backdrop just keeps changing. <laughs> well, the run in the dark, which is a, a great fundraising initiative, thanks to the pandemic and COVID-19, it cannot happen in real life, but it is happening. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it was to be the 10th edition this year. We, we had 25,000 people at mass participation events in 50 cities around the world. It was going to be bigger and better than, than ever, but as you say, uh, we didn't, well, we originally thought we were still going to be able to do it and this coronavirus was all going to be gone by November, but uh, clearly not. And so we've reimagined that particular event. So we'll have 25,000 people all running individually all around the world on the 18th of November. And it, it's it's been a really enjoyable 
business project run in the dark. Now, we happen to use the money to, to help uh, with our efforts to cure paralysis, but as a, as a sort of a standalone business, uh, it, it's been exciting and interesting with all of the challenges that go with small businesses. So we've got the speaking business, the run in the dark, and then uh, our efforts to cure paralysis. But yeah, it's, it, it's back 18th of, 18th of November this year with a virtual event. And, and Jack, um, if conditions were right, I mean, pandemic-wise, you'd be able to play club football, but is it the end of the dubs? And if so, do you miss it, that family that you soldiered with so many times and so successfully? I, I think you're a bit wrong there. I don't think no matter what the conditions were, Clontarf still would have been knocked out of the championship at this stage. So <laughs> my, my club would have uh, come to an end. So... Um, yeah, look, the, I sat down and watched the guys' last league game against Galway the other day, it, it, and I met one of my old teammates for lunch today. It, it, like, it's certainly something you miss. Um, from what I'm hearing, like the whole, it, it's a very challenging time to be involved. Like the social aspect that a lot of people really enjoy there is, is unfortunately being affected by COVID restrictions and social distancing and, and this, that, and the other. Um, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't be one for retirements and things Gaelic football is a hobby and nobody would be happier than me if I woke up one morning and realized I, I was I was looking forward to getting back in with with the Dublin team but at the moment it's it's just not something that uh is motivating me and um it it's kind of not my current challenge as Mark's saying I'm focused on a few other things Okay, and, and work, obviously, in paediatrics, very important work. I should ask you all, really, in, in conclusion, we'll start with Sally in Ethiopia, about what you would say, now, there are alumni watching, but also undergraduates watching, who have yet to determine the way they want to go. Young alumni who maybe are doing one thing and not feeling desperately happy with the direction their life is taking thus far. What advice, Sally, would you give people who, you know, want to do something meaningful? Um, I mean, I'd say that you don't need to have a grand plan. You can take it step by step, apply for everything you're interested in. Um, I actually applied for law, like law internships after I left law or during law. And I remember during the interviews, the interviewers they think that I don't want to be a, they think I want a journalist. And I, at the time, didn't even really realize it like I didn't think it was something that I could do but like then that's what I ended up doing but I just think you don't have to have this idea in your mind of like this will be my profession this will be my job title you can just take it step step by step but keep going after what you really think is important and my other piece of advice would be like do don't be afraid to start from the bottom because if you want to do a job really well you need to you know you need to be humble and you need to take care to make sure that you know everything that goes into it like for example I might really say like you should start doing fact checking and interning like doing the really basic jobs in a tv studio like you need to understand how all that stuff works so you can do a higher job well um yeah I don't know if that's very inspirational but I do I remember as well when I was in law someone said there's not going to be a eureka moment like you just it's just going to be that you keep going and and then you get somewhere. And yeah, I think that's true. All right, and, and Jack, what would you say to those looking to find a direction? Um, yeah, I suppose I'd probably echo Sally's comments a bit. Um, I think there's no real rush to get where you're going. I've found it a couple of times in my life that you get caught up in this. If you're not progressing or if you're not actively moving towards something, you're wasting your time, but there's a long, a long stint of, of working life ahead and um i i kind of have found what works for me is to have a, a little loose plan and have an idea of where you'd like to end up maybe not be too hung up on the specifics of how you get there and make sure that you stop every now and then to enjoy the journey on the way yeah and looking back on, on the success on the football field you know people talk about the the imposters that are both success and failure um you know, does success kind of wane when you look back on it? Or does it still give you a massive kick when you think about what you achieved? No, yeah, I definitely get a massive kick off it still. Um, I suppose 
it's nearly a, a hatred of losing sometimes in sport that takes over for me as opposed to this um, kick from winning. Now, don't get me wrong. You mentioned earlier, how did we kind of combine playing football and, and studying? That was fine. Celebrating and studying was was very difficult. Um, I did thoroughly enjoy any of the victories that we we had along the way. But like, again, that that's another reason to embrace the journey. If you're if you're hung up on on winning, say, in All-Ireland, when you get there, I, I don't know, I suspect it could feel a little bit hollow if you realise that you didn't take time to get to know your teammates along the way, to expand your friendships, to enjoy the experiences. So I think I've gotten a great kick off every season. Obviously, winning at the end has has been a big part of that, and I've been very fortunate from that point of view. But I like to think that win, lose, or draw, it's been the kind of experiences I've had that, that have kind of made it all the more special. And do you think winning six in this very odd year would give the same joy unconfined as winning five? I'm sure it would for the lads involved. I, I'm really looking forward to having it back. I, I kind of went through this, well, like everybody, there's a lot of, there still is a lot of uncertainty around whether or how the championship will run off, but it, it now looks as likely as possible that it will happen. And I think it'll be a great lift. I know, look, there are some people who aren't really involved in sport who probably are a bit put out that that they see maybe intercounty football getting a bit of a preference over other pursuits. But look, to have anything to do on the weekend and anything to talk to with my friends and family, I'm very, very grateful. So I think it will give the nation a big lift. I think whoever gets over the line at the end will, it'll be hard earned and certainly unique and it'll be one a championship they'll be talking about for centuries to come, I'm sure. So, not to be wouldn't it be the wouldn't it be the irony of ironies if Mayo won this year and there was an asterisk after it, and it was the pandemic All Ireland they won, which doesn't really count. <laughs> I don't think it wouldn't count, but uh, <laughs> 2020 would have really done a number on me if Mayo win the All Ireland. I, I will. <laughs> that would be the the straw that broke the camel's back. I think. Now, Mark, your message to those who are looking to find a way and maybe feel a bit directionless at the moment, what would you say to them? Look, uh, Pat, I, I feel like the, the pandemic is my, my third go at uh, a period of uncertainty after initially the blindness and the paralysis and now this. I've had, I've had to come up with a, a shortcut of, of how to get through these things now. And I think what I've learned over the years is that Sometimes we have the luxury of choosing the challenges that we take on, and sometimes these challenges just choose us. And what we decide to do about it, that's what counts. That's what we can control. And I think what I try to do, I think what's, uh, what's important is that we confront the facts of what's going on, that we anchor ourselves with a sense of control by accepting that we do have choices, even if we don't like them. And finally, we chart a path towards a better future with some something to go for, some hope of a better future. So I'm always cycling these things, facts, acceptance and hope. Well, maybe the pandemic has, found, has helped many people to, to find their better selves. Look, it's great talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Sally, Sally Hayden in Ethiopia and uh, a little bit Closer to home in Dublin, Mark Pollock and Jack McCaffrey, thank you all very much for joining us on this special webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sally, Mark and Jack for a wonderful conversation and a special thanks to all of you for being with us this evening. We look forward to welcoming you to our next UCD Alumni Awardee In Focus conversation next week with Professor Delia Grace Randolph and Dr. Cormac Kilty. Visit the UCD Alumni Awards website to register. Thanks again to Intel for supporting the conversation this evening. But now it's my pleasure to introduce Nicole Black, Director of Alumni Development, to say a few words. Stay safe and well. What an absolutely fascinating conversation. I hope you found that as interesting and thought provoking as I did. It's a real privilege to know that our UCD alumni are driving such important change and helping to shape the world beyond COVID-19 for future generations. I'd like to thank our awardees this evening for giving so generously of their time to share their UCD experience, insight and inspirational achievements with us. In this exceptionally difficult period, we know our awardees have many demands on their time right now, and we are delighted they were able to join with us tonight. 
Our alumni are the backbone of this great institution, and despite these challenging times, we are more committed than ever to strengthening the links our alumni have forged with both UCD and each other through our alumni programme of online events and celebrations such as tonight. While we can't unfortunately all be together in person, it is still so important to celebrate our alumni's achievements and through them show the breadth of impact UCD alumni continue to make all over the world. Our 2020 UCD alumni awardees are truly some of our brightest and best and we are delighted to have been able to showcase them in tonight's very special webinar. As ever, a big thank you to the wonderful Pat Kenny, a fellow alumnus and dear friend of UCD, for hosting the conversation for us again. The awards may look a little bit different this year, but they just wouldn't be the same without you, Pat. A huge thank you as well to all the alumni team behind the scenes for helping to reimagine this year's awards under difficult and often ever-changing circumstances ensuring that this important celebration could still go ahead. And of course, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight in helping to celebrate our outstanding awardees and being proud of what makes the UCD Alumni Awards such a special event for all of us. As we close tonight's event, it just remains for me to wish all of you, wherever you are from, all the very best for joining us in these incredibly difficult times. Please stay safe and well, and we look forward to welcoming you to more upcoming events with UCD. From all of us, take care and good night.